it's I mean, it's, very, it's pretty good. Good. The guys are actually the that, that, that yeah, we, I, think, I believe it is. It's not part of the main fact. You do have some ways to run it, Ron. Okay, somebody, I already admitted them in, but okay. somebody pops in and it's recording. Perfect. 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 Yeah. Well, we did not. I remember seeing it, but I don't know. The, the reason our, our survey stopped is because um, oh, yeah. as you look at like where we did the direction, there was that line of the trees that was impenetrable. And then after that, it got like really oh, piece of, I don't know. Yeah. The concrete is very near the edge of where that is. Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. I should have looked at today. Straight on that one. Yeah. Oh, right. 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 Are you a Zoom person? Uh, sure. Okay. Because like, they might have a few people trained. That was. Okay. I'm going to stand up there, though. So that's fine. That's fine. I have a Zoom person back here. I'll do what I can do for you. If you, if you get yourself. Decades. So it's going to record the audience well, but you stand far away. I don't generally have a problem projecting. Except the whole room. Mm -hmm. Are you going to say a little overview of the history of the site? You'll need to do that. I was going to just me mention it briefly uh, in my do, presentation, I'll, but uh, I'm, just going to introduce I'm sure that you could give a much better overview of the history. Than well, I'm going to be taking people here who have already had the fifty four, yeah. or they're going to have it, and I'm going to do the snows off the ground. So okay. Go awesome. You're optimistic about the snow being off the ground. Ron, Ron Wickham. Hey, how are you? We're here. You just oh, you better, you better drive in the new. All right. So where is Ron? Well, what are we saying? I don't know. Uh, okay, so that means the owl is not on. So this is no, it's got to be on. Hold on, let me just change the participation. I have to click to the start. Oh. No, we didn't start the video. Here we go. Well, we got everybody. <clears throat> yeah, Ron's coming in from home. Yeah, Ron and Joan. Okay, so my name is Joan Hill. I'm a member of the Top River Snow Preserve Management Committee, as are Anne, which is the chairperson, and Tom, who's on our left in green. And then I'm just going to introduce people as quickly as we're here. You know, so we have a select woman and head of the uh, historical society, and it's the only select person. Mark also sitting behind the little computer there is our town manager. And then Stefan is, uh, works for Preservation Connecticut. And he's the one that has done his master's thesis, which became the application for our state historic site designation. So he knows the whole history of the property really well now. It's been helpful guiding the work that was done there by the town. And Chris is on the Open Space Committee in the corner. And then everyone in the middle is some interested parties that are either volunteers who just came to hear the history. And so I'm going to turn it over to Dave. So Dave is uh, in the back. David Leslie, Dr. Dave Leslie is an archaeologist, and he also is the principal of the Terra Search uh, Geophysics Company. And he's the one that did the survey with both GPR and the Magneton Control. So Dave, it's yours. I'll get started in just a second as soon as I can share my screen here. So, would you like people to wait to ask questions to the end or? No, if people want to, if something isn't clear, please ask a question uh, while I'm doing it. Um, I'm not sure how that will work if you're on Zoom, but if somebody's back here on the computer and there's a question, just let me know and I'm happy to answer it. Uh, can we turn the lights down? Sure. It's pretty off. Is that off? Okay. 
Okay, so thanks, Joan. Uh, like Joan said, I'm going to be talking about the geophysical survey that uh, we at Terra Search Geophysical did of the Hop River Mill complex here in Columbia. So uh, I'll just walk you through a little bit of what we're going to talk about today. Um, this is the aerial. I guess the laser doesn't show up on the computer screen. Here it is again. Anyway, I'll use my hands. So uh, this is the general project area here in red. For those of you who can't see where I'm pointing, uh, it's labeled on the screen. I'll I'll give a, just a brief background of the mill. Uh, again, there's far more historical documentary research that both Stefan and Joan have done. Uh, <laughs> here, I'm just going to contextualize the property a little bit and then jump into a little bit of what we were, we were doing here. Uh, the geophysical survey of the Hop River Preserve. Uh, in doing so, I'll discuss remote sensing techniques that archaeologists use for a number of these types of sites. Specifically, I'll go over the two types that we applied uh, here at the Hop River Preserve, and then I'll go over some of the results, which I think are really exciting, um, which really sort of go hand in hand with a lot of the historical research that's been done on the property. Oh, it's really hard to see stuff with all these little things. Uh, anyway, um, this is just a, a LIDAR bare hillshade of uh, the area itself. So again, that project area you can kind of use what it's worth, uh, would be sort of here, right? And you can see some of the features, I'll talk about them in a minute, uh, that are preserved in that uh, bare uh, hillshade model. So a LIDAR image is taking uh, in this case, uh, a plane was flown over top of the state at a low level where lasers were emitted from the plane and they bounced back. And you're able to remove the tree cover from this resulting map and see what the ground cover or, or the ground surface looks like. Um, but here in this project area, there were a series of industrial buildings uh, and mills that were constructed on the property between 1719 and 1929 when the last mill ceased its operations. Uh, throughout this period, there were a number of different types of mills that were used on the property, grist mills, saw mills, ironworks, folding mills, cotton mills, silk mills, paper mills, and the leatherboard factory. Again, I'm not going to go into the details about all of those, just that there has been a lot of industrial activity on this relatively small parcel of land. This is dangerous, uh, letting in a phone number. The uh, original mill... And the dam and the raceway were built by Lazarus Manley, who constructed a grist mill. They used the grist, he used the grist mill to produce flour uh, for people in the town. Oh, I think that. And then. I'll have to wait until you click back on the screen now, and then I can advance the slide. So just put left click on. Should be okay. There we go. Okay. Yeah. So the property underwent lots of transformations over this 200 year period before the industrial activity ceased. And what we're looking at here with the LIDAR is really a combination of all of that activity, right? This is everything that we can see in 2018 when this LIDAR image was flown. So you can see here uh, the tail race, uh, the sluiceway is sort of hard to see, but it's up here, um, it's right here, I guess. Uh, the dam is over here today. Uh, and there's a number of other features over here uh, that you can see a little bit. But we'll get into what these look like geophysically as we do the survey. So just to give you some illustrations of some of the maps that have been collected that show where the Hop River Mill was uh, sort of through the years. So here we're seeing uh, an insurance map of the Hop River Wharf Mill in 1874. You can see an artistic, again, I'm trying to use the laser pointer, reconstruction of the building here as well as a plan view of it. So north is sort of this direction. If we go back real quick on my map, north was this direction, so they don't really line up right now. Uh, but you would imagine turning this to the left somewhat. Uh, as I said, this is a plan view map of where the buildings were in 1874. So you can see that the building goes over top of the sluiceway here, and there's another sort of shed or other uh, building over to the left. That'll become important later. As we move forward in time, uh, this is uh, actually back to your notes forward. 1882, an illustration, again, looking very similar. The sluice way is here, or is this the tail race? This is the back of it? Yeah, it's the back. The back. So this is the tail race coming out of it. Our survey was on this area here, on the other side of it for the most part. It wasn't really uh, back in this direction. 
And then uh, again, moving forward in time, 1888, another insurance map. So we can see that they're continuing to add buildings, uh, additional structures to this mill. So the main building is still here. There's additions that have come on this direction, uh, a road trace sort of here, and a substantial uh, building over here. Again, we did not work in this uh, section of the preserve though. Uh, historic photograph uh, of the property. Uh, again, um, looking this direction. Looking east. Looking east, yeah. So, some of the techniques that we use as archaeologists are called remote sensing techniques, where we use a number of different techniques to identify archaeological features or archaeological sites without digging. Um, these are, you know, ways to map these cultural resources in a non-invasive way. It's a really good way to determine what types of uh, structures or objects you might have in your project area before you do any sort of uh, investigation. And that's because as archaeologists, whenever we do excavate a site, we're, we're destroying portions of the site through this investigation. So this is a really good way, using remote sensing techniques, to map archaeological sites without destroying them. There's a number of ways uh, that archaeologists do these remote sensing techniques. Uh, one is ground penetrating radar. We'll talk a lot about ground penetrating radar today. You'll get sick of seeing ground penetrating radar maps by the end of it, I'm sure. Um, metal detection, uh, using a uh, metal detector to find buried objects that are iron, copper, uh, giving off a metallic signature. Uh, magnetometry, uh, ways to measure passive magnetic fields of objects or cultural features that are buried in the ground. When I say features, I mean things that people did in the past that leave some remnant of their activity, but not an object. So not, not, a, um, not a piece of iron, not a, um, you know, not, not uh, a brick, but some structural footing, some structural uh, footprint, some cellar, things like that. Those are cultural features. Uh, we use unmanned aerial vehicles or drones, uh, pictured here. Uh, LIDAR, we have already shown you maps of that, bearer pill shades from that light detection and ranging technique. Uh, sometimes we use cadaver search dogs too. That's particularly useful when we're looking for unlocked burials. Uh, but basically, we're going to be talking about ground penetrating radar and magnetometry today because those are the techniques that we use here at the Hop River Mill Complex. So I'll just give you a brief background into what those techniques are so you have a better understanding before I show you the results. Um, ground penetrated radar is an active, non-invasive method that records the dielectric contrast of subsurface material. So it sounds complicated. What it means is that the radar machine, the, the ground penetrated radar antenna is active. It emits a signal, it emits pulses of radar into the ground and records the differences in the amount of time it takes that radar signal to leave the machine, hit something that is reflected, or continue down through the subsurface, hit another thing that is reflected and bounce back. It's all based on time that the in nanoseconds that the uh, radar leaves the antenna and comes back to the controller. Um, like I said, this fault of electromagnetic magnetic activity is either reflected or absorbed by contrasting sediments. Um, the majority of these reflections, when we think of radar, ground penetrating radar with the ground, are generated in, in between soil layers. So think of like a top soil layer or a subsoil or your native soil layers, and then the glacial or the sea soils or bedrock layers, right? Different layers of earth um, are going to generate different uh, reflections, or they're going to be more permeative, more, they're going to reflect or absorb that radar material in different ways. It's not really a soil profile, but a way for identifying stratigraphic layers. Uh, and if this were to work, um, this will move this direction and you would see the radar bouncing off of it. This is an idealized reconstruction of a uh, coffin buried in a graveyard. There's supposed to be subsoil here, a coffin here. Uh, the animation isn't working, so you just have to take my word for it. That if it did work, it would look pretty cool. Uh, and if you would see something like this, uh, this is what would have been here in relation to this coffin here, but instead what we're seeing here are lots of coffins. Uh, so I think this animation is going to work. Yeah. So this an antenna moving back and forth over top of the ground surface. 
And so it travels a distance uh, laterally across the Earth. And then you've got here a time in nanoseconds that it takes that cone of radar to come down and reflect back. Uh, but we convert that time because the time in nanoseconds doesn't make a lot of sense to us in the real world to a depth. Uh, generally, as an archaeologist, I think in meters, but we can convert it to feet too. Um, and then this is either a positive phase or a negative phase in the radar screen. But what we're seeing here really are these conical shapes here are coffins in a graveyard. So those are um, coffins. You might say, why do they look conical shape? Coffins aren't conical shaped, right? They are rectangles. Uh, it's a good point. Um, that's because this data at the edge is not real. It's, it's the physics of uh, the, the antenna and a cone of radar where it's ahead of the radar machine until it's underneath of it. And then it's behind the radar machine as you're moving, seeing a buried object in front of it, underneath of it, and then behind it. So these are like ghost tails, right? Where you're not really over top of it. You don't see the actual shape of the object until you're over top of it. Um, it's all very complicated, but it's it's ways that we understand as we look at these radar maps, what we are looking at. These shapes, some of them are quite striking. This one is a very clear, well-preserved coffin with probably an air void uh, intact underneath of it, or inside of it, I mean. Um, but these edges to it are not real. And so these are all just ways that we as ground penetrating radar specialists take the data that we see and convert it into real world examples so that we can make it palatable and understand. Magnetometry is different from ground penetrating radar in that GPR is an active sensor, so it's emitting radar and determining based on the return and time it takes for that radar signal to come back to the machine what's in the ground. Magnetometer, magnetometry uses a passive sensor that is attuned to to the Earth's magnetic field in a local area. So we take the magnetometer and we tune it to north, south, east, and west using a compass bearing to determine the magnetic field. That's what this is. This is the magnetic field in one general area uh, so that then we can pass it over top of the Earth and figure out variations in that magnetic field based on things that are preserved in the ground. Um, as an archeologist, the things that we're interested in uh, are iron objects, of course, uh, other metals mm -hmm. uh, that might be magnetic. Those all have uh, strong to weak magnetic fields. Uh, structural remains, particularly bricks, you wouldn't think that bricks would have a very uh, strong magnetic field, but because each brick is clay uh, that has a sort of magnetic signature from where that clay was, and you burn it or fire it in a kiln, you're locking in the magnetic signature and elevating it, and then when you interlock a bunch of bricks, those are different magnetic signatures that are all in different orientations so that it sort of makes the machine go haywire a little bit, but it really jumps out at you. Uh, and then hearts for the same principle, right? So an open air heart or a furnace of some kind is going to be very, very magnetic uh, in the ground. As our house floors, things that just pick up a lot of bioactivity uh, are again going to have pretty high magnetic signatures relative to normal soils. Here's another way of looking at this. So this is a different kind of magnetometer machine than the one that I use. This is Jared Burks from OVA. Uh, again, you've got the Earth magnetic field and then local variation from, say, an intact coffin, stone foundations, rebar that might be uh, within a project area. <clears throat> so based on objects or features that are preserved in the ground, as well as the orientation of that object, the magnetic field could be highly positive, negative, or you could have both in the case of the reef, right? Where you're getting both aspects of the magnetic field. And so just to give you an example of what magnetometry looks like, uh, this is an example archeologically from a site uh, that I did a couple of months ago uh, in Castine, Maine. This is Fort Pintagoet, the 17th century uh, fort on the coast in down East Maine. Um, it's a French fort. Uh, you can see there's a lot going on here in this yard, but what's really interesting is this area here, where there's this high white area and black area, and we know from maps of the fort that this is actually where the blacksmithing took place, so this is, imagine this is the transect of the magnetometer was moving along, this is the actual magnetic data, where this is sort of zero, which is normal, so it's a little bit elevated, 
highly negative, highly positive, highly negative. That's the blacksmithing area. Again, highly positive is an internal wall, and then a brick sort of a cobbled courtyard here, which is slightly positive. So just an example of what the magnetic uh, anomaly maps look like when you record them archaeologically. But what did we do with the Hop River uh, survey area? We collected three gridded surveys, which you can see here, uh, based largely on areas that have been cleared of vegetation so that we could do the survey. Uh, grids one and two were surveyed via magnetometer as well as GPR. Grid three was not possible to survey with a magnetometer due to a lot of obstructions. And these were areas that had been highlighted by Joan Hill as likely to contain structural remnants based on mapping and historic documentary research that her and Stefan had both done. And this just gives you a sense of the individual transects that we collected via GPR. So it's a lot of data. Um, these are each individual green lines where it stops is where we had an obstruction that we were no longer able to survey. A large tree is here. There's a tree system over here as well. A smaller tree, a smaller tree. Uh, we've collected 160 individual transects in these three grids. Uh, over a thousand square meters were surveyed. Um, all of this was done at 25 centimeter or 10 inch intervals because that's a good way for us to be able to see to image really fine results where we can really see uh, what's in the ground. And there were a lot of obstacles we encountered. Um, however, uh, even though this was a pretty difficult area to survey with all of these obstacles, um, a lot of vegetation, including, so the vegetation had been cut, but there were a lot of root systems that were still preserved within the, the uh, project area. Uh, lots of rocks as well. I mean, it's Connecticut, there's always lots of rocks, but still. Um, we were able to determine the structural remnants of lots of these mill features, which you can see the outlines here in red. So this is sort of jumping ahead, but these are the ground penetrating radar results of the survey with several cellars here, a large, uh, massive building with a sluiceway going across it, just as we saw in those insurance maps, and then additional buildings as well. So I'm going to now go through what these GPR results look like. Uh, what we're going to do is do a survey through uh, the ground, <clears throat> starting at the ground surface in grids one and two. So um, what you're looking at is a plan view amplitude map of the ground penetrating radar results. So the results are actual profiles that we collect upon this entire area. But then we take an algorithm and relay to this algorithm what is highly reflective in white versus what is not reflective, comes up in darker or black. And then this allows us to look at things that uh, are reflective in plan view and sort of a three-dimensional view. So this is zero. I'm just going to sort of go through. Uh, you'll start to see some shapes start to show up as we get deeper. And then I'll show you the annotations of those, some of the profiles, and we'll move on to the magnetometer results as well. So this is zero to 10 centimeters. Uh, what we see here are largely surface rocks, basically, things that we had to go over. 10 to 20 centimeters. It, it doesn't look like a lot. It looks sort of like a, um, well, uh, like a basic cable TV where there's no, uh, there's no signal coming through or something like that. Um, I promise you there's, there's things in here that you can see, but we can't see them until we get sort of through all of it. 20 to 30 centimeters, 30 to 40. We're starting to see a little bit of a rectangular shape here. Um, 40 to 50, that rectangular shape is much clearer now. 50 to 60, 60 to 70, 70 to 80. Again, it's very hard to see. Um, 80 to 90, and about 30 to 40 centimeters, some stuff will start to jump out of us, but you can already start to see the rectangular here, 130 to 140, 150 to 160, 170 to 180, and now we can start to really see as we get down to 250 to 260, these areas here are areas where there's actually no GPR data coming back, um, and nor ordinarily, that would mean that we're not very confident about these results, but because the rest of the soils were so clear as containing rocks and other sort of normal stratigraphy, it's very clear that these areas where there's no results is the result of some sort of cultural activity. So some structure is preserved there and that's it's absorbing all of the GPR energy. That's why we can see these very sharp 
right angles here. 300, it's even clearer now, right? And that's the thing that as archaeologists, we're always very skeptical of things being natural if they have these sort of right angles or dimensionality to them that you don't see in nature, right? That also helps that there are historical maps that show exactly where they should be. Um, so we'll look through only at the layers now that we annotated. So again, there was a structure here, 40 to 50, that structure continues, you can still see it, 50 to 60, 60 to 70. And then at 130 to 140, we no longer see that earlier structure, but we can start to see the outlines of the sluiceway, as well as the building that went over top of the sluiceway. No data was collected here. I have to believe that the building continues, uh, but we weren't able to collect it because of that dense vegetation, uh, 150 to 160. So if we go back here, it's hard to see, but we can start to see where those are gonna be. And we can see these three cellars as well, preserved there. And again, it becomes much clearer by the time you get down to two to three meters in depth. Very clear at this step. So we'll look quickly at grid three, which is a small add-on grid over here closer to the road. So if we go back, you can see this is where grid three is over here. The road bends closer towards the dam. Um, again, we'll start at the surface. We move through. But you can already start to see this is pretty different than the first two grids that we looked at. There's something highly reflective here that has a right angle going this direction. So pay attention to that. And it continues to be highly reflective at depth. And by 100 centimeters, we've sort of lost any, any of those clear reflections. And there's not any of that uh, swamping of the data as we saw in the earlier two grids. And so here, uh, we do have another structure. It's one that I'll show you in the profile why it looks quite different than the other two. But there does seem to be pretty good evidence for a structure that goes just off the grid here where we weren't able to collect. And that's partly because this is where the uh, construction fence was at the time, I think, uh, for the road work that they're doing for the bridge. And again, we continue to see that structure at depth. So, these amplitude maps show they're only as good as the data that you collect. And that's why we collect them at 25 centimeters so that we can be sure based on that cone of radar that comes underneath the machine that what we're seeing everywhere within the grid is pretty true of where it is. But the real data lies here within the radar grams or the profiles that we collect in the GPR. So here we see an amplitude map of grid, grid one, the blue arrow here, is this radar gram here from this to here, right? So it's this part here is zero, where it ends is at about uh, 12 and a half or 13 meters. And we're cutting right across this cellar. So it's useful to look at uh, both the normal stratigraphy outside of the cellar and within it. Um, I mentioned that the cellars in grids one and grid two were only really clear when we were beneath them, right? When that radar is being absorbed by whatever material is in that cellar fill, um, such that if you're in normal stratigraphy, you still got a lot of signal and getting radar bouncing back. But within these cultural areas, these, these structures, you're losing the signal completely. And that's what you see here, this loss of signal in these three structures. And so what does that look like in the actual data? Again, there's three potential structures. Um, so this is the radar gram here that shows us what it looks like underground. This is the scope of that data, that radar in this, this one position where the yellow line is here that shows the radar signal coming back. So it's pretty strong even at two meters and that's largely because there's something really reflective here um, right at the edge of this uh, structure, some kind of probably bedrock or large rock. Um, I don't think that this rock actually stops here. I think it probably continues over here, um, but we just can't see it because uh, this is a normal stratigraphy where we are getting good radar return in areas wherever there isn't a cellar. But within the cellar here, where the green one is, you notice that about 130 centimeters, we've got very little radar return. And that's because we're losing that signal here 
I think that's probably because all of these sellers where we lose that signal are sellers that have a stone, maybe cement, concrete, or a brick floor. Um, and that floor is highly reflective to the radar, but also it's not just highly reflective to the radar. That floor is going to capture water as it comes down through the system normally. So I think that there's a combination of both a stone or cement floor, as well as an area for water to pool um, at about 130 centimeters here, such that we lose a lot of the radar signal. It's not terribly important, but, but it does explain why we can see these rectangular signatures. And you can also see that within the cellar, there's many more reflections up here in the radar than there is in sort of the normal sphere detail. So if we look now in grid two of the GPR profiles, uh, this is that shallow structure, which does not have that same uh, case of losing the radar signal as the structures in grid one did, or the larger massive structure did. Uh, this is a relatively shallow, shows up at around 30 to 40 centimeters. Um, and there's potential footings or foundation edges to it here and here. Uh, so there's vertical cuts right here that you can sort of see where the radar is identifying a large rock or stone here and here, as well as some internal stratigraphy that's a little bit different. Uh, there's no clear uh, concrete floor though. Um, and so that's why we lose this by the time we get to about uh, 80 centimeters or so. You can't see these footings anymore or the center of it either. And then this very massive building uh, that we see in grid two. Um, it's a very uh, deep structure compared to the other ones. So we start to lose uh, the signal at about 150 uh, to 130 centimeters again. Um, but it's huge, right? It takes up almost half of the grid. But there's that clear signal loss within the sellers, not at the edges though, right? So here, this line again, moving this direction this way, zero is at the baseline coming here. So I chose it because it captures an outer wall, an inner wall, or another, an outer wall, another outer wall, and another outer wall. Here, here, and here. But again, this likely has a some kind of cement or stone lined or brick lined concrete floor. And as I said, these red areas indicate the walls and footings of the structure. The same thing is true if we look at a line moving across the sluice way to this other exterior structure here. Um, here's the sluice way. The structure on the other opposite side of the sluice. There's again this clear signal loss. Um, I, I think that probably means that the sluice way was uh, stone lined. Also, uh, it could be a combination of stone lining or simply that this is where the water is continuing to flow to, right? It doesn't have to be stone line. It could be that the water is again causing the signal loss here, as I thought it was pooling in these other areas as well. And then finally, uh, structure, uh, the final structure is rig three. This is a very shallow structure, but you can see it's, I think this one, um, it's only preserving the small portion of the grid, uh, possibly uh, preserving some of the demolition or filling in of the structure. That's why it's so complicated uh, within uh, the portion of it here, where you've got a lot of these complex hyperbolas that are reflecting back. It's near uh, to the Hopper River Road. Um, and it doesn't, again, even though it's very complex, we don't lose signal underneath of it compared to the rest of the uh, the crotch area. So that's very quickly the ground penetrating radar results. Uh, we'll go over quickly now the magnetometry results as well. Um, this was not as difficult uh, as the GPR uh, interpretations, largely because many of those things, such as the rocks that are buried within the project area or the roots, are not as sensitive to the magnetometer as they are to ground penetrating radar. There were still a lot of obstacles, though. Um, but like within the GPR, several structures were identified. And something that makes me feel very good about these techniques is that 
I believe the same structures were identified. So these are the magnetometer results from grids one and two. Um, it's very messy. Uh, and that's because there's so much metal or magnetic materials buried within this project area. Uh, the black areas are positive magnetic fields, whereas the white areas are negative magnetic fields. The fact that this is so negative suggests that um, maybe large sections uh, of those uh, the walls of, of the building might have brick line uh, because the bricks generally have a very negative signature in magnetometer. It's unclear, but that, that's one possibility. Uh, these are the structural remnants that were preserved. So we can see a somewhat different shape for this large, massive building, uh, but the sluice way is still there, as is the building that continues on the other side. Could be that the magnetometer is picking up the edges of a patio outside or a driveway outside of the building that the radar was not. Uh, if we compare them directly, so we can see here, uh, this is the exact same area on the left of the magnetometer is here on the right of the graph penetrating radar. Um, if I step over here, um, you can see those walls are where the blue arrows were in the radar. And that's where you see a highly negative peak in the uh, magnetometer results versus the highly positive peaks of the interior stellar fill. So, um, again, very, very uh, similar results, slightly, uh, slightly larger in the magnetometer and the footprint of what the building looks like, but overall uh, very similar. So if we come back and look at the footprints that were identified, we have really excellent evidence for three structures within grade one. Grade one actually in the GPO went far, but that's why this continues out here. Uh, one structure in grid three, and then a very large massive structure in sluice way, as, opposed, as well as two smaller structures in grid two. This is what it looked like in magnetometer, so a little bit offset. And if we look at them together, um, again, you know, these correlate pretty well. Uh, this is a little bit offset. It could be that the magnetometer works based off of a pace. So walking downhill, that pace might be slightly exaggerated versus the survey wheel, the encoder wheel in the GPR, which is key to a distance as it turns. But if we finalize these and look at them on uh, LIDAR here, uh, this is, the, again, that bearer fill shape map. Uh, and we then overlay that earlier uh, insurance map. So if I get back here, this is using the position of the sluice way as well as the building edges here. And if you remember this jutting out that we identified, which is important for georectifying this uh, with the building, we can then look here at how they overlay together. Um, this one is a little bit farther off. It's unclear if this is the same building or these are a series of later buildings that are unrelated to this one because this is largely outside of our grid area where we surveyed. But overall, this I think these are incredible, uh, incredible results for how close these two are to each other. Okay. And those are the GPR and magnetometer results. So, there weren't any questions. I don't know if I didn't see them. I'll just look through the screen, but I'll answer any questions you have now about. Joan, what do you want to do with these results? Well, that's another meeting. Ah. Uh, I have a couple of questions anyway. You say that's the step. Looks like you said the uh, point of the question. I just have this one. That one there. Yeah. And that tells you an awful lot. And I didn't mention it because I only noticed it, noticed it today. Um, let me go back and put it for a second so you don't get busy. Uh, let's see. They're like breaking results that I would have thought today for the first time.
think there's a road here. I think this is a road that leads to that structure that was here. If that side of where the building is, I think it's large enough to have been able to, uh, for carts and horses to uh, turn the carts here. That's why it's so large. But I think I have to look more at this um, before I finalize it. But I think this is probably uh, a path of some kind or roadway um, here from here. What are you guessing the surface of that road might be? Um, I have to look. I haven't looked at it in profile yet because, again, uh, these map the amplitude maps help us to identify areas that have rectangular or other sort of shapes to then go and look at the profiles. Um, I, I would say that it's probably uh, either gravel or. Um, just hard packed earth uh, is, is, is my estimation because it, if it was stone or brick, it would have shown up very clearly in the radar and we would have been able to see it. It, it wouldn't have been something that I would have missed on the first pass. So I think it's probably a uh, hard packed. I, I think gravel would show up really clearly too. So I think it's probably like a hard packed earth one and that's why it was so faint. See? Can you go back to the one where it really showed up? This one? Yeah. That's that one. Yeah, that's 40 and 50 centimeters. That. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it could have been something larger that could have been that was built kind of into it. It could be an addition off of it. That's true. Um, so I'm just thinking that that first rectangle that you found was smaller. So well, it was after that, you know, yeah. It was earlier because this. Apparently, in the insurance maps, and basically, like the things that were near the factory are insured, and this other one is that one in the trees mm -hmm. that doesn't appear on the insurance maps. I figure that's old at that point, or not insurable anyway. Yeah, so I'm just wondering if, if that you know area was something that was cut into when they made the uh the later factory, and that's why you have that outline around it, sort of. Maybe. Um, um, it could be cool, but it's sort of weird that they went in that that direction. That, so you're sort of implying that that came when the big factory was already built? Because I was, don't was think that I would imply to know what date it would be. How would you be in any of these? I, I, I can't date them unless they're on top of each other. Yeah. And then I can just say that one is underneath the other one. How would you be able to distinguish the difference between man-made structures and glacial deposits? Sure. Uh, so man-made structures, uh, like I said, generally have some sort of form or structure to them that glacial deposits don't. Um, here, uh, glacial deposits uh, like an esker, or so an esker is like an underground river, uh, or um, moraines are also almost always on a, on a large uh, scale, right? And so those are the sorts of things that we see as uh, taking over almost entire portions of our surveys when we look at them in those radar. I mean, they're, they're, just, they're just bigger. That doesn't mean they can't be small. You can have glacial drop stones that are smaller, right? right, right. Um, but but generally, they, they also, they have, they have directionality to them because Glaciers moved in one direction and they don't really retreat. It's just that there's less input from ice coming in, right? So they don't retreat, but there's just less snow accumulating. So they they look like they retreat, but they don't retreat. And things drop out of them. But they're just they're just on a different scale than most man-made things. And that's that's the main way, mm -hmm. um, I guess is the quick answer. Mm -hmm. But uh yeah, scale wise would be much bigger as compared to yeah nature. but but they can't i mean they can leave some you know uh glacial striations they're small right um those are things that as glaciers move and grind on top of bedrock they leave sort of striations along them those would be hard to pick out in radar mm -hmm. uh but they, they just they just look different than the sorts of things that we see uh with uh with human activity uh some of the easiest things to see with radar are actually uh, post-European context, so Euro European style structures, because 
they have such a clear geometry to them. They're rectangular. Um, they have vertical cuts in them that are at 90 degrees with respect to the surface of the earth. That's not true of a lot of uh, indigenous uh, features. Those are much more ephemeral, uh, dug generally without the aid of shovels or things like that too. So they're dug um, at sort of a 45 degree angle. They're just harder to see. You can see them with radar, but they're harder. Um, but in general, uh, historical period features are relatively simple to see in radar compared to other things. Sure. Yeah. But one just thought about the road that you're mm -hmm. looking at. So, in the building that it goes to is a shallow building, right? Shallow yeah. compared to the others. To the others, yeah. yeah. So, I'm thinking they actually put in a steam boiler and a smokestack, you know, on that side of the factory mm -hmm. after like 1880 or something. Okay. And so, that could be the road to bring the coal into the yeah. coal storage in that. So, it could be a little weird. Sure. It's kind of hoping it was earlier. So, why do I see sort of a white Square here is that just what you what you see is the happens out happens. no what you see is the beginning of the sluiceway yeah. and you see the white on either side of it oh okay. so you're starting to see I'm sort of seeing like a square around this thing but maybe that's just my yeah I, I, I see a yeah, yeah. I, I think this is irregular that yeah. looks to me like you know something okay. It's in the roots of those great big maple trees that probably nothing was in our next Well, year. that's really over here, right? Yeah, the roots will run. The maple trees that run out a long way. Yeah, way. and and that's that's something that like we should talk about. Yeah. Um, in most GPR surveys, uh, you can clearly see the dendritic pattern oh, yeah. of the roots, which I I don't see here at all. Um, which again goes back to <clears throat> saying that. Overall, the sedimentary signature here is very complicated. Yeah. There's so many rocks in the soil, so much, and it's not just rock, a lot of it is it's debris from the mill, right? Um, that that it's the radar doesn't have a chance to see the root systems emanating out from the large tree, which, was, which you know, um, it's unusual. Uh, generally, those are the things that you see at the top 30 to 40 centimeters very clearly are the root systems. We didn't see them all. Well, that tree is very close to the factory. The pictures that we have mm -hmm. looks like it's maybe 15 feet away from the wall of the mill. Yeah. yeah, like there's see there are roots here a little bit, uh -huh. but like I, you, you should see it. It's like it looks. I, I don't have an example to show you, but it's clear. Anybody who sees them knows that that's what they are. Tree roots, as soon as mm -hmm. they're now. Dendritic is the term that I would use. So can we look at the grid three one? No, the other. Yeah, you got to go. Oh, yeah, so is this dark line It's like right here. Yeah, it means that um, there wasn't any data collected. Oh, that's so what stopped right here. There was like tree data okay. and got on the other side. Right, and then, so say again why it is white as opposed to dark with the other foundation. What it means is that it's highly reflective. So it means that um, I think what it means is that. It's demolished, and there's like uh, the fill. I think it's the fill from the demolition, or uh, when it was disused, people used it to fill up with trash or something like that because it's next to the road. It's a good place for people to dump their trash. There's, there's a couple of reasons I think that's why it is, uh, but I, I think it's probably demolished. Okay. Yeah, so I'm looking But is there a way with the factory, with this factory? Yeah. Is there a way to tell the depth of the foundation that's closer to the surface? So, you know, I know you're picking it up much better as you go deeper as far as the you know, reflectivity, but at what point might we find the foundation below the surface? I think in much of it, it's, it's at about a meter. Uh, and I think it's. Here, like 120 to 130 centimeters. Wow. I mean, I don't, I don't even think that's everywhere because there is a piece of it that's preserved up near the top. And I think that's here, actually. I think that's this. Um, so, how do you get these images? Is it from aerial? Uh, uh, an aerial reading that you're getting? This here, this image here? Everything. No, this is so this is from the machine where I, when I drag it from here, this is my grid. Uh, and this is this is the actual data. 
that I collect. And then I take it and put it in a program. And the areas where it's reflective versus not reflective, that program knows that that's uh, 80 centimeters deep. And so it shows it as uh, white right here. And it shows where all the other areas that are white at 80 centimeters are, and all the areas that don't have reflections, which are darker over here at 80 centimeters. And it stitches them together and it, it, it does a data interpolation technique where it sort of ex extracts all that information and produces this plan beam out here. So the magnetometer image of the big mill yep. seemed to have a rectangular attachment on the side where that small rectangle was, you know? Yeah, I think that... So you think that might be the same thing? I think it's reading it as different, yeah. as, as more connected. But it's at that depth, that the shallow depth that that small rectangle was? Yeah, so if we look at the curve, that's the best way to do it. Yeah, that one. Yeah, so it's, I mean, it's close, but it's not the same. I don't know if that's more of that row, or what you said, it could be... In addition, outside of it, too, I mean, what we're seeing is the accumulation of all activity yeah. over that 200 year period, right? Um, some of that, those add ons, will not be as clear in radar as they will in magnetometer, too. And they're, the machines are reading different things, different aspects of what's in the soil. But um, depth wise, is that yellow bunk? There's, I, should have, I should have said that. There's no depth of that. Oh, there is. That, that magnetometer is simple, simply a reading of the magnetic fields that exist as I move the machine over top of the earth. So if something that is like eight feet deep and has a super powerful magnetic field, I'll see it. But if it has a weak magnetic field, I have no chance of seeing um, it. It's just what is there, what's preserved. Um, and so if there's something above it that swamps it out. So what I should have also said is that, uh, and, and this is true of all the maps that I showed you, these are the result of a lot of different techniques to extract relevant information from the data. So transforming it in such a way that uh, for the radar, I extrapolate and extend the signature farther down so that I can clearly see things where there would generally be signal loss, but I've amplified that signal in a way that uniformly transforms all of my data so that I can see for three meters really well. For the magnetometer, because like, there were giant pieces of iron at the surface everywhere. Yes. I've taken a lot of that data out because it would be it would just be like black. Yes. So I've removed a lot of the very high data that's like uh, this. This is a I think seventy uh, nanoteslas to negative seventy nanoteslas, uh, and I think I, I took the top it, like it wasn't one hundred and fifty to negative one hundred and fifty, and I removed half of the data off of that just because it was so noisy. From all the elements there. Huh. So, great big black rectangle, not rectangles, but corner items. Does that look like they're separate rooms? Is that yeah, that's what I think it is. I think that it's separate rooms versus interior walls. <clears throat> uh, I don't know if those walls clearly aren't there anymore, but it's like rubble fall from the walls. Or what it is is it's material that makes up the walls, like brick, right? Uh, that is highly, I mean, it just shows up in magnetometry because of what I said. Bricks, bricks don't have a super high magnetic field, but when you interlock them related next to each other, they, each brick has its own magnetic field that is linked to its position on the surface of the Earth relative to the Earth's magnetic field when you fire. And so if you take 50 bricks and lay them in a line, um, it creates 50 individual magnetic fields that are not similar, that are very different from one another, uh, interlocking such that the magnetometer is going to read an incredibly negative signature. I don't, I don't know really what it is, but it's not negative 150. It's probably negative 3,000. It's a much larger number because the field is so strong. So your magnetometer, you are running that along the ground? Is that right? I carry it. It's about 10 centimeters above the ground. Okay. Yeah. All right. So each one of these lines right here, like is that? The width of these lines is the width of your magnetometer. So yeah, these are patches. So I, I stand here at like uh, 50 cents. What it is, I have a dual magnetometer, one that reads on one side of me and then the other, and I stagger myself mm -hmm. and do it again, staggered, so that I have collection every 50 centimeters of the magnetometer. And so as you move along, how, at what pace are you uh, you're able to do this? Yeah, yeah. so it's, uh, I, I, this I collected at 1.4 meters per second, I think. But the way that I do it, super high tech, I take a string that I've got a uh, flagging tape tied at one meter each time, and it beeps when it's supposed to be at one meter. So I time myself so that 
my I'm always over top of the fly view tape every time it leaves. So I keep the same face. But it's, I mean, it's really important because if you don't keep that face, then things that it, you know, you could be off, right? Where it's supposed to be. Yeah. The radar works differently. It's a survey encoder wheel that turns. And as that turns, it fires the radar. And I, I code that encoder wheel to a distance. So I set it as a 10 meters and then it knows what those 10 meters are correct, basically. So what about cold? How does that show up at all? Unbreakable. Yeah, I don't. Uh, I don't know what the magnetic signature of coal would be. I'm not sure that it would have a very elevated magnetic signature. Mm -hmm. um, because again, the, the coal storage was like right in this area. And burnt coal would have a super. Stack, one of these, yeah, the smokestack. Right, and it's a remnant thermal activity. Yeah, would would certainly have an elevated magnetic signature. It may be that coal has an elevated magnetic signature. I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, certainly, slag would. Well, right. So when when you're when you're when you're using coal, there's going to be some slag that precipitates, mm -hmm. um, and that will have a, a very high magnetic signature. Oh, okay. Because it's been burned. Because it's been burned. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. But I, don't know, I never thought of what my next year's report. So is the sure fact that's in the sluice, is that indicating certain materials there as well? I think what it indicates is uh, the way that it's been uh, dug out. So um, I didn't talk a lot about it, but uh, topsoil has a higher magnetic field than subsoils do because of uh, bacteria. Mm -hmm. So the, the microbial uh, life that lives in the humic layers of topsoil um, is more magnetic than the subsoils. Uh, so when you dig down and disturb that uh, topsoil and you model it with subsoils um, through the creation of the way, you would then have an elevated magnetic signature to areas around you because of that, right? And so the same thing with like palisades or any sort of earthwork is going to uh, have an elevated magnetic signature to normal soils around it because you have modeled those layers and then preserved them. Mm -hmm. um, that's only true if you can remove out those large magnetic signatures that are around it. If it's a subtle signature. Um, and, and that's sort of borne out here by the sluice soil, which is more subtle, right? Um, than these areas here. Right. Okay, last last question of mine. So you had another sort of built-in fear. Yeah. And one of it's, it's there. So I don't know if you remember, but there's a berm that starts uh -huh. where the, the pond is here. Yeah. And the sluice way is here. And then there's a berm that runs from there and it comes out as a stone wall and you get yeah. here. But it's it's farther, it's outside the area. It's farther from what I Yeah. So That's is it. that yeah. I think there's a building here that was just on the other side of the sluice way. And it was at a left at a depth that would be now under that burn of the lake. Uh, we're adjacent to it. I don't know that it went under. Uh, I mean, it's the remnants of this building exist, uh, and it appears to be go off grid, but I can't. So that might be an interesting little trench to run from that corner up towards that room. Sure. Yeah. Uh, to see if it continues and what's there. Yeah. Okay. okay. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? All right. Well, thank you so much for doing the work and explaining it so thoroughly. Well, you always ask some more questions. If you have to. Sure, and I'll uh, I'll give you an addendum that shows that for you. Yep. So there is a printed report that includes all these images that will be in the town hall, I expect, at some point. I'm not sure where we're going to keep it. But uh, that will be a graphic so you can that too. Maybe we'll put the PDF up somewhere. So we can then, you know, look at it that way too. Sure. So, super. All right. Yeah. All right. The lights. Do you know the date that this spruce was planned? 
I'm sorry, I can't hear you. You know the date that the loose loose way was put in? The loose way? Yeah. The, the, the one that's the on the other side of that room, right? The one well, whatever the fact that yeah, is, I can't point at it now. But yeah, so that sluice way actually runs across the road right. and up along the Hawk River and it comes in below that bridge that's on the end on the rail trail. But I think that was the original sluice. In fact, it made it more work on the other side of the river, more you know, mill activities. But yeah, so I would guess right from 1719. I think yeah, they, they improved it. Probably deepened it, okay. maybe reinforced the size of it. Yeah, but it was, we have a Mr. Earl saying how Mr. Jilson, who was one of the millers at that time, 1865, brought in gravel to stabilize the sides of the sluice. I don't know which sluices are from, but it could be the one that went under the mill. It could have been the one that's the way. There's a lot, of, it's a lot, a lot of erosion now, so it's really a lot deeper than it was. But yeah, so I think that was the original plan of Mr. Lazarus Manley to protect the mill in the, you know, from flooding. Basically, he made his own river that was manageable. Cool. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Sure. Did, did he come in and turn off the recording? I don't know if he still I think it's still recording. Oh, okay. So then we couldn't be able to do that if we don't have to. I mean, you man.